I think that it's important to supplement beyond our food. If for no other reason, the argument you could make is that we have such a polluted world today with our soil, our water, our air not being what it was, well, certainly before the Industrial Revolution and definitely before the turn of the 20th century when we started using so many chemical inputs and then later when we started genetically modifying our crops. And now we have plants that are just inferior nutritionally from what they were 100 years ago. I think there are several arguments to be made for why that we should supplement with certain things. I know omega-3s are very near and dear to you. That's certainly a great example. Vitamin D is another one. Calcium, magnesium, vitamin C. I mean, we could go down the list of things that Americans in particular are either deficient or insufficient on today. Welcome to Nutrition Without Compromise, a podcast brought to you by Orlo Nutrition. We believe that nutrition shouldn't be an either or, that you should never have to sacrifice your morals for your health or that of our home planet. Join natural products veteran Karina Belizzi and experts from around the globe as they discuss healthy solutions that are better for you and better for the planet. Welcome to another interview episode of Nutrition Without Compromise. I'm your host, Karina Belizzi. Today, we're going to learn about a foundational set of micronutrients that you may not have heard that much about. They're health promoting, they're longevity supporting, they're ultimately nutrient powerhouses, and that is polysaccharides. You'll get to learn how these powerful nutrients support your body's natural health defenses, and in particular, how they could even be key in the quest to treat and even reverse the progression of neurodegenerative decline. Joining me today for this health discussion is John E. Lewis. He is a PhD and the founder and president of Dr. Lewis Nutrition. Dr. Lewis is the past associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. He has been the principal investigator of over 30 different studies in the research career that he has, evaluating the effects of nutrition, dietary supplementation in particular, and exercise on all aspects of human health. He has over 180 peer-reviewed publications to his credit in some of the world's leading scientific journals. Dr. Lewis embodies the model of health by eating a whole food, plant-centered diet for over 26 years. He takes certain key dietary supplements like the polysaccharides that he'll talk to us about today and through a rigorous daily exercise training program manages his health. John has a passion for educating others about the value of health and he's here today to share that passion with all of us. But before I bring him up, Remember that this podcast is here as a resource to educate and sometimes even entertain. It is not intended to treat, diagnose, or cure any health ailments. There is no patient-provider relationship established between me, your host, or our guests like Dr. John Lewis. With that out of the way, here he is, Dr. John Lewis. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Karina, for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I look forward to our conversation today. So I just want to get started learning a little bit about you. You know, what really led you on your journey to this whole foods, plant-based, healthy living perspective and even considering supplementation? Well, that's a great question. I, I would say it goes way back in terms of uh, always being somebody that played sports as a kid, I grew up, you know, feeling like playing sports was a big deal and always being physically active. I thought that was a big, or it was a big part of my life as a kid. And then as a, as a university student, I got into drug-free competitive bodybuilding after my sports careers were over and uh, really got into how the body responds to nutrition, exercise, that type of training. I probably, uh, I would say I overcompensated going down the road of bodybuilding in the sense of being very skinny most of my life and then getting into bodybuilding to, to try to overcompensate for being a very skinny kid. And and my body really responded to that. But I think, you know, as we do, we, we evolve, right? We change over time. And as we age, and especially as we become young adults, we start reflecting and, and doing sort of an inventory. I, I really decided that I would never make a living or have a, you know, a, a financial uh, basis from bodybuilding. I, I just wasn't going to, I wasn't ever going to be willing to do drugs 
that would have allowed me to perhaps do that. I just wasn't willing to take that risk. And so I, I started shifting my focus more from like a performance orientation to a health orientation. And while, you know, for those people out there who are blessed with the ability to make a living in, in some kind of sport, uh, you know, have that genetic ability, that genetic gift. I mean, obviously nutrition is, is, or at least should be, I mean, I guess not every single professional athlete focuses so much on nutrition, although that's probably more true today than it was 30 years ago. But, you know, compared to those people, the rest of the world ought to be a much bigger source of, you know, the people who are looking for answers related to health, uh, which in my opinion, you get mostly through nutrition, obviously exercise is an important piece as well. So I really sort of evolved out of, again, a sports performance into a health performance or I'm sorry, a health orientation perspective on, on what I was doing in my life. And it just kind of went from there. And then I got into academic research, not really intending to do it, but just as I continued my education and my training, I, I decided that I wanted to be a researcher. And I, I did that for roughly 20 years. But supplementation was something that was kind of an aspect of my bodybuilding. Back in those days, I was taking creatine and I still take creatine. I think it's a very important thing to take, not just for sports performance, but actually for, for a lot of different reasons to take creatine. But I didn't really focus too much on anything other than, you know, back in those days, say more than a multivitamin and mineral. And it really didn't dawn on me the importance of supplementing, you know, with certain things beyond my diet. I, I guess you could say that I was one of those people who initially in my life and my career thought you could get everything you need from food. Fast forward to today, 30, you know, 30 some odd years later, and I'm completely the opposite. Now I think that, yes, of course, you cannot just supplement your way to health, but uh, food is, is, you know, it's difficult. I mean, even if you're buying organic and non-GMO and, you know, you're trying to buy local and all these different other strategies that you can implement, if you're, if you're fortunate enough to be able to do that, a lot of people obviously are not financially but if you, even if you can do all of that, I think our food still comes up short in certain things that we need that um, are really important from, from a supplemental perspective. And if not, then, you know, you just have a little expensive poop and urine. I mean, you know, again, depending on what your priorities are and, and how you choose to spend your discretional income, I think that, um, you know, it's important to supplement beyond our food just because of if for no other reason, the argument you could make is that we have such a polluted world today with our soil, our water, our air not being what it was, well, certainly before the Industrial Revolution and definitely before the turn of the 20th century when we started using so many chemical inputs and then later when we started genetically modifying our crops. And now we have plants that are just inferior nutritionally, you know, from what they were 100 years ago. So I I think there are several arguments to be made for why that we should supplement with certain things. I know omega-3s are very, very uh, near and dear to you. That's certainly a great example. Vitamin D is another one. Calcium, magnesium, vitamin C. I mean, we could go down the list of things that Americans in particular are either deficient or insufficient on today. And, and again, I think a lot of people are, you know, they're, they're not, unfortunately, they're not very conscious about or conscientious, I, I should say about the decisions they make when it comes to food, right? I mean, I think more people are concerned about, you know, for example, the car they drive, the clothes they wear, the jewelry they have, the home they live in. And then when it comes to food, they just, you know, their elbow bends and their mouth opens and they throw something in there without much thought or consideration. And that's where we have, you know, downstream from all of those decisions, from the individual to the societal level, that's where we have just epidemics of chronic disease today that I think are, are very much driven by uh, poor choices in diet. And of course, sedentarism is another key factor. And, and so we could go down you know that road as well. I'm sorry if I'm being a little long-winded. I think you've touched on a few things that we should unpack. I mean, one of those primary being, you've mentioned the need to, to supplement because our, our foods, our diet is not necessarily getting all of those core nutrients from the foods that we consume. And one of the facts that leads there is simply that the carrot that we consume today doesn't have the same nutrient profile as prior cultivars. And part of that is because we have 
bred them selectively to be sweeter, to even have a different color. There are white carrots and purple carrots now, and these have different carotenoids in them because the carotenoids are, of course, what give the carrot its beautiful, vibrant orange color. And so even just how we have managed our food supply over the years has shifted. So if you want to make sure you're getting enough vitamin A, you have to be consuming a variety of fruits and vegetables or in that, you know, yellow, orange, red perspective, and not necessarily just a carrot. <laughs> so we have, we have some significant shifts. I mean, you see on the picture behind me, if you're watching on YouTube, you'll see that I've got a plate of food displayed. And it's arugula with some radish and some tomatoes. Each of these things has powerful plant nutrients in them and even some polysaccharides. So I'm here today to talk about polysaccharides. And I'd love for us to be able to kind of use this as a demonstration point for why certain nutrients should be looked to in a supplementary way, especially if you're not eating a plant-centered diet that's ripe with whole foods. We could all be eating the way you see this picture behind me and getting, you know, some really great nutri nutrients on our plate with every meal. We may not have the same problems. So let's start with polysaccharides. Sure. Well, and to add to your point, I mean, polysaccharides even take it one step further because the, the work that my colleagues and I have done over, gosh, nearly the last 20 years are from foods that are in two, two particular foods, one of them certainly that no one eats. I don't know about you. I know no one who eats aloe vera. And then the other one is rice bran, which obviously comes from rice, but most of the world prefers to eat white rice. I think 70, 80% of the world eats white rice, which has no rice bran. So these two particular uh, polysaccharides are absolutely the types of nutrients that Mo I, I, again, probably 90 something percent of the people definitely are not eating any aloe vera polysaccharides. And then from the rice bran, again, most of the world is not eating brown rice. So even if they were, probably are not getting enough of the polysaccharide content from that rice bran, from that cup of brown rice anyway. But these polysaccharides, Karina, I mean, we've just, again, just demonstrated time and time again in our research laboratory how effective these things are and just how truly pleiotropic their benefits and their activities are. It, it's really quite astounding. And of course, if you ask someone uh, about the benefits of aloe vera, 99 out of 100 people will say it's a topical purpose, right? Like, you know, humans mostly don't even think of using aloe vera orally. They think if you have a sunburn or a cut or a wound, use some aloe vera gel and put that on your skin. And that's, that's a nice uh, application for it. But I can tell you based on our work that it's far more potent when you consume those polysaccharides after you've stripped the water out. And, uh, and now you have this concentrated source of these polysaccharides. It's way more beneficial to human health than if you just consume, you know, some of these products you see on the market, uh, aloe vera juice or whatever they're referred to. I mean, to me, it's not like you're going to be harmed or hurt by those products. I just think they're basically a waste of money because... They're going to give you very little therapeutic benefit compared to a concentrated amount of the of the polysaccharides in the powder. So, so let's talk about what polysaccharides are. Poly meaning many, right? And then saccharides, which are water soluble, sugar like substances. Correct. Correct. So I think it's you know it's always a good opportunity to educate people about what polysaccharides are in the context of how many years, how many decades has it been now that we've essentially been told by the mass media over and over again that sugar is bad, right? Like, oh, you know, it's bad for you. You can't take sugar. And that's true if you're talking about a certain type of sugar, mostly simple sugars that spike the blood glucose, cause you to have a high insulin response. I'll be the first one to, to be on the, you know, throwing out the high fructose corn syrup from the, from the diet. You know, anything that, any kind of a package that you might consider buying that's got high fructose corn syrup in it, by all means, do not use that type of sugar. But I think what it's important for people to remember is that there are at least two primary characteristics of sugars that really would drive your decision whether or not to use them. The first one is a sugar is not a sugar, meaning the source of the sugar is very important. So we just made the distinction between, again, poly uh, polysaccharides coming from aloe vera and rice versus a, 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 a simple sugar coming from corn. 
So the source of the sugar is very important. And then secondly, of course, that I'm alluding to is the biochemical structure. So how many carbon bonds, the density and the complexity of all of those different uh, molecular connections within the compound are also the second key characteristic. So we have basically, generically speaking, three different types of sugars. We have monosaccharides like fructose and high fructose corn syrup. Then we have disaccharides, a little bit more complex sugars like uh, sucrose. And then we have the poly or oligosaccharides that are the most complex sugars. Again, from things that I mentioned like aloe vera and rice bran. And of course, more commonly people think of, you know, like sweet potatoes or, you know, all of your different vegetables, your greens, uh, all your different fibrous vegetables. So, and even beans and, and, and lentils as well. So obviously those types of polysaccharides are, are much different. And again, when you're talking about the complexity of the information, it's almost like trying to categorize a 5D uh, structure. It's, it, they're so dense with information that they cannot be completely characterized graphically. So it, you're talking about a source of information when if you want to take it one step further, what do our genes do when they receive information from the environment? And typically that's from our food, right? I mean, we get information that comes in from the air and the water and other things that we drink and even exposures, obviously all those things talk to our genes, but really what the genes listen to the most is the things that we eat. And so this complex coded information in these polysaccharides has actually been shown to be more dense than even in amino acids and fatty acids. So imagine that for a moment. And this is the reason why, I mean, if you want to continue going down this road in biochemistry a little bit, we can, but the, uh, the information that these polysaccharides contain are just so dense and so complex, and they ultimately help to, to guide and drive the bioengineering of our cells. And so that's where, you know, the genes receive the information from the environment, and then they tell, they guide our cells on how to function. And so ultimately, I mean, we all love, you know, a good tasting meal, but, but essentially this information that we get from putting things into our mouth that ultimately we, we consume and we metabolize, that information is really ultimately what I think is, you know, is, is reminiscent or is indicative of the term, you are what you eat. And that's so true just based on, you know, now what we know through the study of biochemistry and all these different types of nutrients and phytonutrients that again, direct our genes to then tell ourselves what to do. Expanding on this for a moment, I think that what you're essentially getting at is that when we get the right polysaccharides into our bodies, when we get more of them, we could turn on or turn off certain gene expressions, right? So that that then dictates your health outcomes over longer periods of time. So in the case of someone like myself, who I understand that I have one representation of the APOE4 genome and allele, right? Which can mean that I am at a higher likelihood of developing Alzheimer's or dementia or other neurodegenerative issues in my later years. Now, if I eat right, get the right nutrition, get plenty of omega-3s, like with Orlo's polar lipid omega-3s, then I'm going to be less likely to have those activations go on for the development or progression of these sorts of diseases that can accumulate when we don't get the right building blocks throughout our life cycles. Is that a fair assessment of where your understanding is when it comes to these powerful polysaccharides? That's right, exactly. So again, everything that goes into our mouth is so crucial to how we function. And so that's where I was trying to link this idea that, you know, again, people have most people today have sort of this mindless attitude about what they stick in their mouths compared to all of, all of their other behaviors. But it's so crucial just to your point of you having this APOE4 allele, which makes you a little bit more of an elevated risk candidate for dementia or Alzheimer's. And so, again, everything that you're trying to do is to prevent that expression of that allele. And so what you want to do is obviously, you know, send your genes in the other direction, essentially. But the easiest way that you do that is through your nutrition or the, the simplest way, I should say, in, in terms of the information that you can load your genes with. And obviously, you know, exercise, uh, proper sleep, stress management, not using tobacco, not using or very much limiting your use of alcohol. There are obviously lots of other behaviors related to all this. 
But in my opinion, when you look at the, the vast and enormous amount of research that's been done under, let's just say broadly, nutritional science, to me, there's really nothing else that compares to any other behavior that we can control every day. And, and like you said, to, to, for your own, you know, in terms of your own genetic profile, what you or anyone else would need to do to help to prevent having that type of expression occur later in life. Now, you mentioned alcohol, and so I've got to touch back on a couple of things. I am connected to several neurosurgeons and neurologists, each of whom essentially say that alcohol is just not good for the brain. Like this is not something like no amount of alcohol is good for the brain. And part of this too, is that there's this connection between the liver and the brain. And so if we mind our livers and if we support a healthy liver throughout our lives, that our brain will be in better, a better aging state as we get older as well. Now, at the same time, we also have people like Dr. William Lee, who we've had the pleasure of featuring a few times on this show, who has said plainly, one glass of red wine, preferably organic, and, or one beer is okay, and probably even health promoting in its own way would be more so if it didn't have any alcohol to it, because then you could get the benefits, let's say, of some of the poly polysaccharides in the wine, but none of the alcohol. What are your thoughts around all of this perspective? And, and what do you generally caution people to do? This is a great question. And I, I'm certainly I wouldn't characterize myself as an expert on the literature and alcohol, but it, it is fascinating, at least, and perhaps very discouraging at worst that I'm sure you've read in, um, I'd say going back for the last decade or so, there have been a lot of studies. And of course, we can't enroll humans in clinical trials using alcohol or not. That would never pass an, eth pass an ethics board. But nonetheless, all these large epidemiological and observational studies, granted that have a lot of error. I'm not, I'm not saying they're the gold standard either, but a lot of these studies in the last decade have been showing even just a little bit of alcohol we're not talking about, you know, binge drinkers or even people that are doing the regular one to two or whatever drinks uh, per day in the evening with dinner. We're just talking like, you know, limited, like having a drink or two like every month or so. Uh, some of these studies are showing quite interesting and significant links between what is considered, I think, for anybody who's a drinker. And I'm not, by the way, I haven't touched any alcohol in over a decade now. But uh drinking like very little amounts of alcohol and actually increasing their risks for different types of cancers, particularly breast cancer in women. So it seems to be going against this notion that, oh, well, you know, drink your red wine. It's got resveratrol. It's got other things in it that are health promoting. But, you know, I think a lot of those studies are flawed, too, because they look at they try to tease out the effect of alcohol among all these different behaviors that people are engaging in. So, you might find that the person who enjoys his or her drink of alcohol, whether it's red wine or a beer or even a mixed drink or whatever, may also be the same person who's doing lots of other things that are health promoting and health protective. So I don't know that there's enough good research out there to just say that, you know, drink your red wine every day. And like you said, organic. I mean, to me, that almost boils down to the alcohol industry trying to take a message where they know they have a product that if you drink it, it potentially can be detrimental in many different ways. Uh, we don't talk about, you know, all those different things, especially related to accidents, which I think is probably the primary, dr primary driver of a lot of these early mortalities. But nonetheless, I think, you know, the use of alcohol to me, I, I just don't, I, I, in other words, I think you could get your respiratory from eating lots of other vegetables and fruits without having to deal with the other effects that may be consistent with taking red wine. And, and again, you know, if we're not even talking about drinking a lot of alcohol. We're talking about a fairly minimal amount and still driving your risk of different types of cancer. So for me, like I chose over 10 years ago, no longer to drink. And even then I wasn't drinking that much anyway. I mean, I don't know, literally two or three drinks a year. That was all I was drinking for many years. And I, and I will say, I'll give, credit to bodybuilding in the sense that when I was in college and getting into bodybuilding and I would be with, you know, as most people do in that age, socializing with their friends on the weekends. And, you know, we'd be out at a club or something, having a drink or two. I realized that living like that and trying to be a, a competitive bodybuilder at the same time <laughs> absolutely was no bueno. I mean, it didn't, those kinds of behaviors were not parallel with each other. So 
it was a pretty easy choice for me to make the decision that I just, I wasn't really going to drink that much anymore. Plus I never yeah, liked Well, it. people who drink are generally a little puffier too. <laughs> like, right. You just don't look as shredded as you want to as a bodybuilder. I would agree with that. But I just, I just, I don't know. I, I never enjoyed the taste of alcohol anyway. So I want to bridge this for a minute because there's a researcher, you know, you get the the doctors that are on with the resveratrol, even trying to make, um, you know, really high concentrates of it and offer those as products. But there are also polysaccharides present in grapes, present in grapes, and also present in grape seeds themselves. And so you can get extracts of grape seeds that are high in those polyphenols, which are also very health supporting and which have research behind them to benefit your health over the long, long term. Or you can also do as I do. And just when you see organic grapes and different varieties that are in season, you can buy them and eat them. <laughs> and you can get some of these benefits from them as well. There's also a very interesting book because we've all heard about the French paradox, right? Like how can French people drink this red wine and eat these brie cheeses and, you know, go ahead and have these fatty rich foods and still have this amazing health and have a lower incidence of heart disease and heart attack and cancers, et cetera, et cetera. Well, they have so many lifestyle compounding factors that are different, like two hour lunches and more days off per year and better balanced lifestyles, generally speaking, less so when you're in the big cities, but definitely when you live in the country. And then also there's this incredible book by Dr. Kate Rome Bleu, who's out of Canada. She wrote a book called The Calcium Paradox, and she argues that it's not just a resveratrol and red wine, but in fact, even more likely that it has to do with consumption of these cheeses that are fermented and have very high levels of vitamin K2, MK7, like the moustères and the um, brie cheeses and things along those lines. And so these individuals in France who are eating this lifestyle are also consuming very high levels of a vitamin that actually helps to keep their arteries clear of plaque, essentially because of how they're eating and their balance of their diet as a whole. So I really like for people to look a little bit more deeply, think a little bit more before you jump on the bandwagon of there's this one miracle supplement that is going to solve everything and stimulate my cert one so that I have longer telomeres and things along these lines. It's, we're complex individuals. Health is more than just one focus, but getting to a space where we have a balanced diet with deeper nutrition is I think critical for everyone. I would love for you to talk specifically about your research and polysaccharides and really just tell us everything that you've discovered and the research that you've personally done. Thank you. I'd be happy to. And I'll start off with what I consider at this point still in my career, even though I'm no longer full-time in academics for the last six and half years or so, but the clinical trial that we ran in people with moderate to severe Alzheimer's disease just completely exceeded any of our expectations going in. We were optimistic based on some of the anecdotal work that uh, my primary colleague, Dr. Reg McDaniel, who by the way, was the person who got me really into all this polysaccharide re uh, research and interest. But Dr. McDaniel and I were able to, through the funding that he received a gift from a family that had lost four members to Alzheimer's, this family decided that they wanted to help him. That turned out to help us uh, since he didn't have an academic position at that time to be able to run this clinical trial. So we used what we termed in the, in the study, in the paper, the, the papers that we've published from this study, allopolymanose multinutrient complex. It wasn't just the polysaccharides, although I will tell you that based on the composition of the formula, the polysaccharides are truly the, uh, the linchpin or the most significant aspect of it. But to your point just a moment ago, I, there is no magic bullet, right? So the cells can't just function on polysaccharides. They need lots of other things. And, and that's the reason why we, we utilized a formula in the, in the study. Sometimes people have criticized us and said, well, you've got this formula of 10 different things in it. How do you know what works? And I'm like, hello, McFly, we don't care about magic bullets. We're trying, you know, we were trying to, and we're still trying to help people with this tragic disease. So anyway, we ran this trial. We put people on the formula for 12 months, which, you know, for people that have a caregiver and have this horrible disease from a conventional medical perspective that has absolutely no efficacious treatment. I mean, the five FDA approved drugs for dementia, if you're lucky, they'll delay decline for a few months, but then you just, you know, you continue falling off the cliff. And so we conducted 
the neurocognitive or neuropsychological testing at baseline three, six, nine, and 12 months. And then we drew blood at baseline in 12 months. Unfortunately for us, the, the funding that we did get was not enough money to do the blood work at, at three, six, and nine. But anyway, we, we ran the study and and we had a, a, I would say, a very skeptical group of colleagues, although, you know, they were willing to help us and, and ethically and scientifically did a very good job of, of you know, running the study and, and being very responsible. But we, Dr. Reg and I had a, a group of people we were dealing with, mostly led by the psychiatrist and then the coordinators that uh, didn't think too much of nutrition research. They were a center where they mostly did drug studies or maybe all drug studies besides ours. And so, you know, they were very much into the pharmacological paradigm. They said, well, you guys have money and we've got a lot of patients. We don't really believe nutrition is going to do anything for these folks, but we're willing to work with you. I mean, that, that was literally the attitude that we got from the, uh, the staff in the center where, where we ran the study. And, you know, Dr. Reg and I looked at each, each other like, what in the world like you know what? I mean, healthy skepticism is one thing, but, you know, downright putting someone else down is another level to it. But anyway, we, we were running the study. And as the study was going, it was interesting because, again, as I mentioned, we were optimistic and we were hopeful. But as the study started going, as we enrolled the first few people, I started getting caregivers calling me in a few months saying, oh, Dr. Lewis, my loved one is now doing things that he or she in some cases hasn't done for years. So, you know, I was getting like really excited and, and my optimism was, was starting to be, um, I guess you could say fulfilled because I was, I was seeing the results of it. And even the staff, even I was getting phone calls and emails from the staff saying, I can't believe what, you know, Mr. Smith is now doing. He hasn't said this or done this or acted this way. And, and again, in some cases in years. Uh, one of the anecdotes was the oldest lady we had in the study, she was 93. I believe she had had Alzheimer's for like 11 or 12 years, of, you know, very old person, very sick person. When she started at baseline, she, she could not walk and she said nothing. I mean, she literally was just like a, a piece of furniture sitting on a piece of furniture. And then when she came in for the three month evaluation, she, act, she actually walked into the center that day and she called one of the coordinators by his first name and he started bawling like a baby. I mean, he could not believe that this lady, you know, actually could remember his name. And so we got all sorts of amazing anecdotes like that. And then, you know, fast forward a couple of years later after the study has concluded and we're working on the data and we're starting to analyze it. And so I, you know, again, I was feeling very hopeful that we had something that was going to be unique. And so it turned out that at nine and 12 months, we had clinically and statistically significant improvement in cognition. Now, Karina, I, I can tell you, and this was according to the ADAS COG, which is widely considered to be the gold standard of assessing cognition in particularly in dementia, but cognition in general, but specifically in dementia. And the neuropsychologist said she could not believe what was happening. And she had worked there at the center for 15 years, was doing all the cognitive assessments. She said she'd never seen anything like it. But I say that clinically and statistically significant, very purposefully, because a lot of times in research, you can have something that's statistically significant, but clinically or practically, it's irrelevant or it doesn't have any meaning. And so- Yeah, you might have been able to move some markers with regard to plaque or something or to cholesterol, but it didn't have a health outcome that was significant. Right. Okay. So in this case, you know, clinical significance in terms of cognition was just, again, I mean, we were so thrilled. I literally felt like I didn't, but I literally felt like tears were coming to my eyes. And I always get chill bumps every every time I tell the story just because of how you know meaningful it is to me and, and all the people that I've worked with now since this last almost 20 year period. But in addition to that, you know, like on the so you have the cognitive improvement on the clinical side, and then physiologically or biochemically on that side, what do you have to support it? Well, several things. First of all, we reduced inflammation according to TNF-alpha and VEGF. So that was very important. Typically, our paper was probably the first one that published that kind of an effect in Alzheimer's disease. Those markers are typically looked at either in heart disease or cancer. We showed a very nice improvement in the CD4 to CD8 ratio, which is your ratio or your relationship between your helper cells and your cytotoxic cells. And so that's not just important for people with Alzheimer's, that's important for all of us 
and we want that ratio to relatively be as high as possible as we as we go through life. All right. So let's stop here for a second because I want to point something out. You've basically said that by giving them this regimen over the course of nine months to a year, that you were seeing significant reductions in inflammation and also in the body's ability to detoxify. That's what it sounded like to me. And so I just wanted to be clear and, and to help people understand what it means in the end, as opposed to just the acronyms. Uh, is that a fair assessment or did I get something wrong there? I don't know if I've used the word detoxification, but I would say lowering inflammation and then modulating or improving overall immune function. Okay. Yes. Those are the terms that I would use. And then in addition to that, we also showed just under a 300% increase in adult stem cell production, according to CD14 cells. So when, <clears throat> when you take all of that in combination and look at this picture together, now granted, unfortunately, we didn't have the money to do imaging studies. And I don't know, 15 years ago, we started this study, I think at the end of 2008 or early 2009, I'd have to go back and double check my notes. And then we published the first paper in 2013. It's hard to believe that's been a decade ago, but I know the imaging would be very good today if we, if and when we have the funding to do another study and, and advance our research. But again, when you look at the clinical side, I mean, unless you're the biggest skeptic in the world and you just say, oh, well, they just had, you know, spontaneous healing. That's a term that, you know, people typically throw around when they have no better explanation for why somebody got better, not just from Alzheimer's, but, you know, basically any type of disease. But Again, unless you're the biggest skeptic in the world and ignore all the rest of the data, that's perhaps one explanation. Our explanation is when you lower inflammation and you improve overall uh, immune function combined with increasing adult stem cell production, the only thing that makes sense to us is that increase in adult stem cells migrated to the brain. Neuroplasticity is ob obviously generally well accepted today. I don't know. There may be a few people out there that still don't believe in that, but... We do know that the brain can regenerate itself, not in necessarily every part of the brain, but in certain parts of the brain, we, the only thing that makes sense to us is why in the world did these people, again, that were with moderate to severe disease, these were not mild cognitive impairment or mild severity. These were the sickest people. And I didn't mention that they are also 79.9 years of age on average. So not only very sick, very old people, and oh, by the way, they didn't just have Alzheimer's, they had hypertension. They had dyslipidemia, they had depression, they had diabetes. I mean, it, you know, these were these very things might be related, you know, <laughs> you get some systemic inflammation does so many terrible things to our bodies. And, you know, I've spent a fair amount of time reading on this topic in particular, just inflammation of the brain and, and how we can work to reduce it. And really the fundamentals come down to reducing consumption of processed foods, increasing consumption of very nutrient dense polyphenol containing foods. You, people say the Mediterranean diet, right? As a for instance, but what is in a Mediterranean diet? You unpack it and you start to see high levels of omega threes that reduce your body's systemic inflammation. You see more plant foods, more salads, more um, olives and things like that too, right? Um, you might have a little bit of couscous, but it makes up a part of the plate, not the whole plate, like a giant bowl of pasta, right? And so we're just eating differently and we're practicing different habits. I think really that's the key. Like we should be sitting down to enjoy a meal that is a pleasant experience that has a rainbow of colors to it, hopefully. So you're enjoying the senses of consum consumption and then that has the types of nutrients that we need in a daily way. And if, if we ate this way our entire lives, we probably wouldn't bioaccumulate just the really terrible systemic issues that we end up with, both inflammation wise, waistline wise, toxin wise, etc. So it makes sense to me. Now I understand the protocol that you've developed is something that you have actually made available through Dr. John Lewis Nutrition. And you did send me some of the stuff. So I took a look at it personally. I've consumed the capsules and the powder, um, which isn't too difficult to do. And I've integrated it into uh, my supplementary regimen for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, the research that you mentioned is, is very compelling. And I hope that you'll provide me direct links to the studies so that I can include them with show notes. And two, I have a personal connection to Alzheimer's. I do have that one representation, but my grandmother 
was diagnosed in her 60s with Alzheimer's disease. Um, and, you know, it manifested personally in a really strange way. I remember at the time I was about 20 years old, 21, something like that, sitting down for a, a barbecue at my father's house on 4th of July. And we're all enjoying some time outside. My barbecue is going, he's grilling some eggplant and, you know, he's got some, some veggies on there. He's getting the meat ready and everything, right. Doing some kebabs of this. My dad's an expert barbecuer. Right. And, um, and all of a sudden with her glass of wine in hand, she just looks at my dad, who's her son and says, and how are you related to the family? And this is my first exposure. He'd seen a couple things that were a little off before that. And he just looks at her and he kind of chuckles and he goes, I'm your son. And she says, oh, stop. You're far too old to be my son. Now, this is obviously somebody who has had a break in their brain somewhere. And now she's experiencing life thinking that she's, you know, probably in her 30s at that point with a young son at home that's, you know, six years old as opposed to 50 year old man. Right Now, I'm sure many of the listeners of this podcast have had a similar experience at some point in their lives with a loved one because we've gotten to a point where this disease is really overtaking our largely aging population. People are living longer, and unfortunately, their health health span really dramatically declines in their last few years and sometimes last few decades because of neurodegenerative disease and neurodegenerative issues. Is it your belief at this point that this is avoidable? Oh, no question about it. I mean, I, I think, I don't know how many of your listeners were fans, are fans of Jack LaLanne. I mean, that guy was an inspiration to me. That guy... I forget how old he was, 93, 94, when he died. And up until the last two weeks of his life, I think he died of a lung infection. He was still working out every day. He was swimming, lifting weights. I think you know, on his 80th birthday, he pulled a boat like he was uh, swimming in the San Francisco Bay or something like that. I mean, there was always something with Jack LaLanne. Always doing something. I mean, what a, what an amazing life that man lived. And so... And of course, he's one of many, I mean, but he's probably the most famous that I can think of. And I just, I think when people have this inevitability of chronic disease mentality, then you are, you know, as we say, mind over matter, you're telling your body you're going to become sick. And so, you know, it's so important that we don't have that type of self-talk. And I've just seen nutrition, especially these polysaccharides, this formula that I've been working with do so many amazing things. And as to your disclaimer earlier in the show, we don't, you know, we're not talking about treating disease here. We're talking about providing the raw materials that it, the body needs to repair and restore itself. But absolutely. I mean, I, I don't think chronic disease is, is, you know, just part of aging at all. I, I, I firmly believe it's not. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm living it. You know, I, I hope that uh, my life, regardless of how many, years I live, I'll still be functional the day that I die, much like Lelaine was. And, and so that's my goal. And, and obviously, we have no cure for mortality at this point. But I believe it's, you know, it, it's so it's so unfortunate that we have a society that's just wrecked by chronic disease when it doesn't have to be that way. I have to say I'm in complete agreement. And I feel like I need to make an introduction for you, Dr. John Lewis to Dr. Joseph Maroon, who's an octogenarian himself and who is still competing in the Kona triathlon, the Ironman each year. Um, He jokes that he is winning his class, but he might be the only person racing in the class. He also says his goal in life is to die young as old as possible. And I think that he's living that reality. Um, As a neurologist and neurosurgeon, I think your research would be right up his alley. And I personally think that together you might be able to advance this a little bit more. Now, I understand how hard it is to be out there and working to build a supplement company to support the health of people and really reach them. Um, What can you tell people about how they can connect with you and the company? And if they're interested in, in giving this, um, this product and this perspective, a world, what would you say to those individuals? Thank you for that question. Well, anyone can find me at, uh, at our, at our main website, which is drlewisnutrition.com. That's dr no period Lewis, L E W I S nutrition.com. And then all the, so the typical social media channels, Dr. Lewis nutrition through Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and a little bit on TikTok. although politically that may not be the best place to be <laughs> anymore for Americans, but 
Uh, I have a lot of information there about my life, my research. You can find lots of articles, lots of videos, and obviously geared toward daily brain care, which is the product that grew out of the research uh, from the University of Miami from my academic experience that I really only touched on one study that there's actually a lot more that, that, that uh, I could go into. We don't have time for that today. But yeah, drlewisnutrition.com is the best place people can find me if they want to learn more about all the research that my colleagues and I conducted, daily brain care. As you mentioned, we have it both in powder and capsule form. Uh, we have other products that will be coming down the pike as well as we, as we continue growing. But you can find my contact information there. I've actually a phone number, email, anybody that would like to contact me for more information, I'm happy to engage with those folks. Well, very good. And to that point, I would like to remind people that this type of supportive nutrition is very good in combination with a really high quality omega-3 in the polar lipid form for better absorption to your brain, because you can get that now from algae or low nutrition, primary sponsor for this podcast. I mean, we bring the, you this show each uh, and every month specifically to help you and really ultimately improve your health and get access to great nutrition information. Omega-3s and polysaccharides, they can work together to create better brain health for the long term. And so I really think that these two things can go together quite nicely. Now, I want to thank you again, John, for your time. I like to end the show with a resource of some sort for our audience. So if you were to give people either a tip, something that they could change in their lives today, to support their health for the long term, what would that be? Or if you had a magic wand to wave and change one thing about health and nutrition, what would it be? So you could answer either of those or maybe both. Wow, those are loaded questions. Well, I think we didn't touch on the subject today, but vitamin D, you know, is such an important, it's not even a vitamin, as you know, it's a pro-hormone, but we have 70% of Americans are either insufficient or deficient in vitamin D. Man, just Take vitamin D, even if you don't have a lot of resources, vitamin D is a very cheap supplement. And guess what? You don't even need a supplement. Just go out in the sun and spend 15, 20 minutes, uh, three or four times a week in the sun. Take off as many of the clothes as you feel comfortable and let as much of your skin get exposed to sun as much as you can. Vitamin D answers so many problems that we're dealing with, again, in these chronic diseases that we've mentioned. So that would be to me, a very simple recommendation that doesn't really re require a lot of effort or money or time to, to help your health. As far as waving a magic wand, man, the, th the thing that I would do immediately is get rid of all of this lobbying that we, you know, we call lobbying in the United States. Everywhere else in the world, we call it corruption, but we have way too much lobbying when it comes to big pharma and big food and big agriculture, how we're squeezing our country in terms of all this emphasis on the, the profit margin or the profit motive at the expense of our health. And it, to me, it all boils down to too much lobbying that's going on in, in you know, the, the relationship between our Congress and, and industry and how that is squeezing out, especially like the, the, fall, the, the small farmers and people that actually grow our food and the way the dynamics of all that has changed. We need a total, we need a total change in the way we're doing government. And I think that starts with getting rid of lobbying and helping people to better understand uh, the value of food and health, as opposed to just waiting till people get sick and then throwing medications at them and then going down this really tragic road that I saw many of my relatives go down. And so there, that, that would be my magic wand like yesterday, if possible. Well, that really did come out of left field, but I have to say, I tend to agree with you that you know, ultimately when we do let rampant lobbying <laughs> occur, then what we get is um, products with special interests. So, you know, there were, there were moments in time where lobbyists tried to even take away the ability for you to go to the store and get that vitamin D or that omega-3, make everything a drug so that guess what? Drug companies can profit and you have less access to the healthy things that support you without getting a prescription for it. So, you know, ultimately, I think we all are aligned with wanting to have better access to healthy products. And um, yeah, I mean, 
I don't know if we can get rid of lobbying today, but I would, I would love to see that happen myself too. Listen, thank you so much for joining me today, John. This has been my distinct pleasure. Now I want to go ahead and remind our audience that we do have some special promotions going through the holiday season or nutrition.com. We're absorbing the cost of shipping for the entire rest of the year. And we still are running our tested by you program. And that means that you can go ahead and come to OrlaNutrition.com, sign up for a subscription to get our DHA omega-3 or prenatal DHA products, and you'll receive in a test to verify your levels of omega-3s today. And then again, after four months of supplementation, because it's our belief that you can modify your, uh, your consumption patterns and see a real change and up to three times better absorption, tiny little pill, just take a couple a day and see where you're at over four months. Ultimately, this can help you make decisions then about whether you need to make additional lifestyle changes to optimize your levels of omega-3s. You can do that also with things like vitamin D, CoQ10. Um, there are several different tests that you can take to verify where you're at. This is actually something that comes with the blood spot test. When you do get it, if you subscribe to test it by you, there is a little spot for the omega-3. And if you decided that you wanted to add a couple of other tests there, I believe it's vitamin D and CoQ10. We don't cover the cost for the vitamin D or CoQ10. Um, we don't own that company, but if to your point, Dr. Lewis, they also wanted to check their vitamin D, they could just pay a little extra. And with that same finger prick test, verify their levels of vitamin D today. So I think I'll end it on that note. Do you have any closing thoughts? Just thank you again, Karina, for having me on your show. It's been a pleasure. I, and I look forward to, if you ever want to have me back, I'd be happy to do that. And, and I hope people got, got something out of the information that we shared related to polysaccharides. I think it's probably one of the most important nutrient most people have never heard of, but remember it, it all comes down to the source. And so anything that you can get from, uh, you know, whether it's my product or some other competitive product, that's fine too. But these polysaccharides can do amazing things for people. And I would encourage them to strongly consider utilizing them if they're not already. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time today, Dr. Lewis. Thank you. What an informative discussion today with Dr. John Lewis of drlewisnutrition.com. Now, it's not often that I personally encounter another supplement company that I feel is so focused on the greater good. So I just want to personally say that I respect what he's doing. I respect the research behind it. And I wish that this product had been on the market back in the days when my grandmother suffered from her steep dementia and decline. I know this is a personal issue for many people, and you may, like me, be experiencing the ravages of something like this in your personal life with those connected to you as they enter their final years and decades. We all need to be seeking a better health span, a better experience living. We should know what it feels like to be vibrant, healthy, and lively, even in our later days. And getting the nutrition right in the very beginning is, of course, the ideal. But you can make changes today that get you there tomorrow and the next day and the next day. You can make changes today that benefit you more with time. We see that time and again with supplementation through things like omega-3s and the accumulative benefit benefit that people get with time. So I will remind people once again, they should go and check out the Tested by You program because it's our belief that this can really be life-changing for you. And we do have a bonus discount. You can use the coupon code NWC for an additional 10% off at checkout. And through the holiday season of 2023, we are covering shipping costs. So there's no minimum for that. I encourage you to go check that out today. Listen, I hope that all of you will do me a solid and raise a cup of your favorite beverage with me as I say my closing words today. Here's to your health. Thanks for listening to Nutrition Without Compromise. To make sure you never miss an episode, subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to learn more, visit orlonutrition.com and join our mailing list. You'll gain access to complete show notes, features, and informative blogs because nutrition shouldn't be an either or.